well, well, well. Helen, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Paddy, too, for the uh, uh, warm introduction to this great event and how nice it is to be here. Uh, as, as Helen said, we consider Trinity College Dublin to be one of our closest partners, and we'll touch a little bit more on that uh, legal deposit relationship uh, later. Um, but I guess the other reason that my, I, my pulse always races a little faster when I come here and why this is such a good topic uh, to be talking about here is that, looking around the room, I'm probably not the only child of the 60s, and I have very particular ideas growing up in that decade of what the future ought to look like, and kind of it ought to look like that. <laughs> Clean lines, modernism, slightly dramatic, beautiful, sinister, concrete, full floors, shiny floors. And I guess that somewhere deep in some psychological recess, it gives me a clue about what the librarian of the future ought to look like as well. And it's sort of all of a piece. So uh, it's a good theme to be addressing here. And I guess those of us, well, my background in media, but also in the, in the library interest, industry, uh, are always on a daily basis trying to think, rethink imaginatively uh, what the future might look like, and of course help to shape that future. Uh, and often it is about choices. And uh, I guess uh, those of us who spend much of our time uh, within libraries, this, for those of you who've not been there, is uh, the main London centre of the British Library uh, at St Pancras in London. Uh, and it is right by St Pancras railway station, uh, built on the old goods yards, very controversially. I'm not sure if people had a theory of the future geographically then, but nonetheless, that's where it went, and interesting things have happened uh, since then. And in a way, if you want to exaggerate some of the choices um, that we feel we're all confronting as we think about our future strategy, uh, you can do worse than to think about the geography of where we are. There's an aerial view there of the Great Victorian railway stations, but the whole neighbourhood is transforming in front of our eyes. Uh, that's us, just to uh, red brick next to another great red brick pile, uh, the, the Hotel of St Pancras. And uh, right next to the railway lines coming out of uh, King's Cross there, in about two years' time, will be one of the biggest single office developments in the whole of London, the Europe, Middle East and Africa headquarters for Google, the other great Google headquarters for the world. So I guess we're already feeling, and you can feel it in the debates around where we are in the UK, a kind of divide breaking up in people's minds. In a few years' time, someone can stand in front of St Pancras Station, and if it's information services thereafter, I guess they could turn left or they could turn right. They could turn left into a universe that maybe looks a little like that, or they could have a different idea of a library which looks a bit like that. <laughs> And, uh, and apparently we have to choose. <laughs> apparently we have to, uh, uh, to choose between two allegedly diametrically opposed set of values here. And we worried about this. Some values which date back not perhaps just centuries, but millennia, uh, which are characteristic of the great historic archives, the great places of scholarship. Uh, they accentuate the need to preserve, to conserve, to respect the highest standards uh, of academic quality, the solitary study experience. And then others say, uh, it's not that. It's a whole different set of values. Uh, it's about openness. It's about putting the accent on giving access. Uh, it's about the social, not the solitary. Uh, it's about thinking internationally, not just uh, on the ground. And I don't think it will surprise, I hope, a single soul in this room if I say, certainly at the British Library, we see no dichotomy here. Um, the glory, the resilience of what great libraries are and can be is that they endlessly encompass and navigate their way right around that spectrum uh, of values. And it's the tensions and the creativity that is sparked when you are determined to deliver services and future-facing services um, that, that um, encompass that spectrum of values uh, that makes the work that Helen and others do uh, in institutions like this so dynamic and interesting. So for us at the BL, we've been trying to synthesize some of these thoughts over these past uh, few years. And uh, last year, uh, just over a year ago, 
we published this, Living Knowledge, uh, the British Library, 2015 to 2023, uh, which on the face of it is one of those gloriously random years, uh, plucked from apparently nowhere. Uh, but of course, for those of you with specialisms in British Acts of Parliament, you'll know it's not a completely random year. Uh, it will in fact be the 50th birthday of the British Library uh, as a standalone institution. There was the British Museum Library, of course, and there were the other uh, great scientific and other institutions that went to make it up. But it, it, we will be 50 in 2023, and we chose that year because it's a good year, uh, because it's a little stimulus and reminder uh, to some of our stakeholders, paymasters, colleagues, uh, that we're young as well as old. Uh, the, the, the BL came into being within a year or two of Microsoft and Apple, uh, and we have that glorious ability, uh, which we cherish, to uh, be uh, uh, still moulding our identity while having roots that, of course, do in the terms of the collections and the items date back centuries or even uh, millennia. It's also, I might say, as a time frame, a useful one. Uh, it's a little bit beyond a political calendar, uh, and it's not so far into the future that it's unimaginable, uh, but it is long enough to get, we think, a few, uh, a few big things done. And what else to say about uh, this? Some of you may be familiar with an important predecessor document that my uh, brilliant, brilliant predecessor, Lynn Brindley, brought into being, the 2020 vision, back in 2010. And this, uh, that had an accompanying strategy called Growing Knowledge that took us, to, uh, took us to last year. Helen, I think, in your time at the BL, you'd have been involved uh, in a lot of the work that went into that. And that was uh, a deeply analyzed look deep into particularly the digital future. And it set uh, a general direction which this continues. There's been no break in continuity here. But the plot has thickened, and that's something uh, that we want to uh, explore a little bit, I'm sure, in, in, in sessions like this. Uh, there have been uh, changes, and uh, certain trends that were just embryonic there now feel a uh, very, very deep part of what we do, a move towards openness of all kinds, institutional openness, openness to more audiences, uh, publishing openness, debates over open access publishing, open data, and so on. Data itself, we knew we were moving into the age of data, but boy, does that feel uh, uh, the landscape now. And then, um, Paddy, you mentioned this, something around the creative economy uh, and understanding that the, the conditions for creative thinking are not just a nice to have somewhere over in the arts industry, uh, there's actually something there in creating those conditions which cut right across the disciplines, uh, which bring different traditions together, different cultures together, and lead to innovation and success in all fields. And libraries, we assert in living knowledge, have a crucial role to play in all of those areas. And we talk about trying to be open and creative and innovative in what we do. But we also stress here uh, that this is a story where the continuities are as interesting as the disruptions. I guess, again, those, uh, that left-right uh, picture around the values. And I have to say, when I was helping to put this together, I was just a little disturbed, though maybe not completely surprised, uh, that even people in very high political office in the land didn't always seem to understand what a library is for or what a national library is for. So we've been at pains here to, to structure living knowledge around a, landscape, a, a language of purposes, which are, if not timeless, then very, very long-lasting indeed. They're engineered, if you like, uh, to see us well beyond the next five revolutions, simply because our predecessors have proven that the idea of the library uh, has lived through several industrial revolutions and social revolutions, and there's a great deal of continuity there as well. So we say, state an overall uh, um, statement of purpose about making these extraordinary collections accessible, uh, and every, we thought carefully around those words, research, inspiration, and enjoyment, and we did put the word everyone uh, in the middle of that, a little innocent word uh, which, let's just say, raises the bar a little bit for us as an organization, but we took a view that we are publicly funded, uh, the collections we look after are the birthright of everyone in the UK, really 
There are global birthright as well, because British history, they encompass collections from all over the planet, all the great language groups. And we wanted to challenge ourselves to endlessly think, particularly in the digital age, how more open, how more accessible, you can never do it perfectly, uh, can these collections be. And then we have six simple statements of purpose. One is around custodianship, a timeless role, which, by the way, consumes a great majority of our, or the larger part of our public budget, which is simply looking after and growing uh, this huge collection, 150 million plus uh, physical items growing all the time still through physical legal deposit and, of course, the digital collections, uh, which grow, uh, I'm not sure I'm allowed to use the word exponentially, but certainly uh, very, very rapidly uh, indeed all the time. And all the accompanying almost industrial scale skills uh, that go with that. Research, of course, you put these collections to work uh, and we're here to support research of all kinds. Uh, perhaps unlike a university, uh, we do have academic and student communities, but we're also here to serve anyone. Uh, all kinds of research, novelists, filmmakers, uh, family historians, uh, anyone with the spark of a business idea and so on uh, needs to feel uh, absolutely welcome and supported uh, at, uh, at the National Library. Business, and some people are surprised to see the business purpose uh, expressed so crisply, but in our Act of Parliament, uh, we're here to support industry, uh, and that's true of the sort of white heat of technology moment that gave birth in the 60s and 70s to the BL. There was a determination that these wonderful collections were not just celebrated for their historical value, but endlessly put to work and uh, for business uh, uh, and uh, a new kinds of entrepreneurship. And we do that through our business and IP center and other means uh, at the library. Culture, of course. Uh, we are, for probably the majority of people, uh, certainly Londoners, tourists around the UK, a cultural institution first and foremost, and it's our job to have memorable cultural experiences. And allied to that is uh, a commitment a little more explicit, perhaps, than the BL has made in the past, to be a learning institution uh, as well, to grow the researchers of the future, to stimulate people of all ages, but particularly when they are young, uh, and I have to say that this was not uh, something necessarily there in the founding father's mind of the British Library. But once you find yourself in the center of a great metropolis uh, with school children all around, and you can see the appetite for this, and this is something where we're now stating it as a clear public purpose, and we are fundraising and, and raising money to uh, invest in it. And finally, we talk about an international purpose to advance knowledge, working with partners around the world, advancing knowledge and mutual understanding uh, that encompasses in some ways all the others and brings us full circle and is a particular responsibility uh, for an organization like, uh, like ours. So those are, uh, uh, that's the framework, if you like, and we found that quite helpful because if you are going to take people on a journey deep, deep into a quite unsettling future, We've been at pains to stress this is not in the name of tearing up the traditions of the library, but simply because the logic of those purposes ultimately takes you to some very uh, interesting places. So with our custodianship uh, mission, uh, we set out in Living Knowledge quite a few big transformations and changes. Uh, Paddy, Helen have already touched on one. We're only two years in the UK. I appreciate you're not quite there here with, with, with primary legislation here, but even in the UK, we're only two years into the business of actually learning what it means to have the privilege and responsibility of legal deposit uh, collecting for digital content. Of course, it's e-books, of course, it's e-journals, but the web is the most thrilling and the most challenging of those. And if I had to sum up what I think the next huge challenge here is, and, and Richard, I'm sure, will touch on this later, it's putting that collection to work. Uh, it's not enough just to compile a data set, just to ensure it's preserved, but understanding that it can be searched, it can be deployed, it can be analyzed, it can indeed be used for enjoyment and inspiration uh, in the language of those, um, those purposes. So that has been and will be a great revolution uh, of the next few years. Uh, in a more uh, mundane but vital way, as ever in each generation, you have pre simple preservation challenges. 
Uh, ten years ago, it was the newspapers in the UK. The roof was falling in. Uh, we, were, we were losing the fabric of the papers. Now, we are in danger of losing another part of our fabric. We are the National Sound Archive. We have six and a half million constantly growing collection of audio recordings. Commercial music, yes, but all other kinds of uh, oral history, rare recordings, um, unique material, and 42 different formats. The formats are fading. The machinery on which to play those formats is fading in front of our eyes. The people who know how to fix the machines to play those 42 formats will fade. And uh, there's a global consensus that we've got about 15 years or so to create a kind of Noah's Ark of digitized audio heritage before, I'm afraid, we'll have another kind of black hole, uh, which is the black hole of recorded sound. And we have a big unified project here. We've called it Save Our Sounds. Uh, and part of it is remedial fundraising, quite a lot of money. We've had uh, a provisional grant of nine and a half million from the UK Heritage Lottery Fund uh, to work with partners around the UK to identify the most at-risk, most important sound recordings. Uh, but we also want to make that part of a wider bit of thinking around the audio memory. Uh, there is no official national radio archive in the UK, uh, and we want to make sure that in 100 years' time, the, the radio that is preserved, at least partially, is not just the wonderful BBC, uh, but actually reflects the full diversity of commercial and uh, community radio. And also we need to think about, in the absence of legal deposit, how we continue to bring music in from a music industry which is becoming increasingly uh, digital. So that is uh, one of our major projects. Another is a different kind of future thinking around uh, the other half of the British Library, which is not in London at all, but in Yorkshire. And here's another fantastic visionary piece of 60s architecture, uh, which is the center of uh, the, the, again, 1960s technological marvel that is the British Library's document supply center in Boston Spa at Weatherby uh, in Yorkshire. And that in itself is, an, is a great piece of visionary thinking that maybe in the internet age felt like it was coming to an end. Who needs a document supply service when you have uh, uh, wired connectivity? But there was a reason it was put there, because it was, it, that, that site was chosen, because good as London is, here's where Boston Spa is, for those of you who don't know. It's bang in the middle of the United Kingdom, of the, Kingdom of the, of the British Isles, in fact. And uh, that was so, of course, that interlibrary loans and other material could, could be accessed easily by lorries. And Boston Spa is changing its character under our generation's watch. Uh, this is the... Um, uh, this is it's a terrible photograph. It's taken on a BlackBerry, uh, but I've included it because it's, um, it's the only photograph I've ever posted on Twitter that ever was remotely popular. Uh, because this was just a, probably the first glimpse inside what we proudly now call the National Newspaper Building, which opened last year in Boston Spa, um, which is a kind of temple to journalism. It's this huge cathedral, 24 by 20 meters, robotically controlled, uh, dark, uh, climate controlled, yes, 750 million pages in there, 33 kilometers of shelving, about 10 years of growth. Every word of whatever quality committed to print by any British journalist since 1600 is in there. And yes, if you've ever had a letter published in a UK newspaper, it'll be in there somewhere. Uh, it is a marvel, uh, and it sits alongside our other repository and is beginning to change the character uh, of uh, Boston Spa to become, we hope, not just a British library facility, but making full use in the age of openness of that geographical location, as many, many institutions of diverse kinds find themselves in possession of important but uh, non-disposable but less used paper and print collections, that the idea of a shared storage facility over the next 10 to 20 years, in which not just BL collections, but other collections can be efficiently managed, looked after, digitized on site, digitized on demand, or on occasion making use of that wonderful motorway network to actually bring them in 24 hours notice to reading rooms around the country. Uh, so a different take on custodianship, and again bringing the technological, the physical, and the digital together in new ways. So our research purpose uh, derives directly from that. 
And again, you'll see in Living Knowledge, we set out uh, the need, of course, for new kinds of research spaces, more kind of collaborative environments. Uh, we're already seeing at the BL, simply by opening up new Wi-Fi-enabled reading spaces in our public areas, that we are creating a kind of bookless library environment, uh, very, very dynamically used outside the, um, the, the reading rooms. But we also talk about wanting to ensure that we contribute directly to research. Uh, we do have an increasing body of digitized heritage. Every year now, thanks to the uh, Mellon Foundation, we've been able to launch a British Library Labs competition where we open up, uh, purely for innovation to the whole planet, people to come up with ideas for new form of analytics, new things to do um, with uh, different parts of our uh, already digitized uh, historic collections, and it's been very successful. It's led to projects like the Mechanical Curator, uh, other bits of analytics that extract um, different forms of language, humor from uh, 19th century texts that were hard to capture by other means. And that is, of course, just one tip of this iceberg, that we are now just digesting what it means for cultural heritage collections to join the family of innovation, very, very dynamic, uh, around the big data uh, universe. And that's where uh, this gentleman comes in, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, for those of you who don't know who he is. Uh, but here he is impersonating, of course, uh, Alan Turing uh, in the recent uh, movie. And uh, Turing's name has been given uh, to a new research institute uh, in the United Kingdom uh, devoted to big data, to innovation in algorithmic science, in higher mathematics for social purpose and economic benefit. Uh, the Alan Turing Institute is uh, an alliance of the universities of Oxford, of course, and Cambridge, Edinburgh, UCL, and Warwick, and the cream of many of their computer scientists and mathematicians are coming together to form uh, the nucleus of it. About 150 researchers on site, we hope, uh, by the end of next year. And what was, uh, a, I think, an important moment for us uh, engaging at the highest levels of government with an understanding about what a library of the future might really mean is that we did a year ago, a year and a half ago, win the competition to host the Alan Turing Institute on site at the BL. Uh, because I think the penny dropped that there's something very potent about bringing together deep, deep intellectual collections with the, the very cutting edge of creative innovation and research uh, in big data. And of course, under the um, uh, direction uh, of the team of the Alan Turing Institute, research will be conducted uh, in all sorts of areas of social problems, uh, finance, biomedical research, but also culture, creativity, and cultural heritage. And I'm delighted that we will be working to connect them to other libraries, other collecting institutions, museums, uh, so that we, we can begin to do a classic library thing of a bridge between worlds uh, to try and live up to that promise of connecting people uh, and ideas. That will lead to business innovation. And I mentioned our business purpose. Uh, we're very proud of our business and IP center. Uh, we're also fascinated to see in this knowledge economy, this creative economy, uh, what is happening even on our doorstep. And a couple of years ago, uh, we were talking to our friends at the Francis Crick uh, Institute, which is um, uh, just north of the British Library, a big biomedical research institute. And we realized that this wasteland of King's Cross had transformed utterly uh, over this last decade, and that now, if you draw a circle around the library, thinking the library at the heart, uh, you have probably the densest con concentration uh, within London of knowledge-generating institutions, universities, research institutes, companies, and so on, but they weren't talking to each other. Uh, many of them were frankly competitive or suspicious, and we were able, I think, in a small way, to play that brokering role that a library at the heart can play. I can see it happening with a within a university context here. It's the trusted center where different forces come together. And out of that came a formal partnership called the Knowledge Quarter. 
um, uh, roughly mile radius. I think we had 35 uh, organizations at launch. Now we're up to 65. And that has helped to open doors, stimulate innovation, um, uh, create more community engagement because there are poor parts of town here, town here, and above all, deliver knowledge exchange between institutions, big and small. And that model, uh, we think, is fruitful not just in London, but in other cities around the UK. Uh, and that's why we're pleased under our business purpose all to be, also to be working with partner public libraries around the UK to set up business and intellectual property centres uh, in now eight, and we've said in living knowledge, 20 centres around the country. And we're determined that those are not just business centres, but thinking of our culture and educational purposes, that they also form part of what you might call a living knowledge network um, of libraries that begin to talk to each other and share expertise in new ways. Uh, because I don't know what it's like here, but certainly in England, at least, the public library sectors, even the grandest of the, and most successful of them, uh, have had a very, very tough time lately. And one of the things in an age of openness you can do is simply uh, engage more, share more between institutions. We've just done it with the wonderful library of Birmingham. I don't know if you've been there. Of course, possessors of the second greatest Shakespeare uh, collection uh, in the UK, uh, but not necessarily with the resource or capacity to do uh, a major exhibition. And by working with them, uh, we've just, we have just co-curated our first out of London uh, exhibition, Our Shakespeare at the Library of Birmingham, which complements our own uh, Shakespeare anniversary exhibition uh, in London. And there's a, a London dimension to this at all. I know you think about the physical spaces, your own exhibition galleries. Here, um, we are seeing 10% compound growth in footfall to our public program, our exhibitions, our learning program, which has been historically uh, under-resourced. When we have big crowds at the library, they are really big crowds. This is one of the, the late events to accompany uh, our recent propaganda exhibition. So I hope over the time of the living knowledge period, you will see change and expansion on uh, the somewhat underused and derelict land between us and uh, the Francis Crick Institute uh, just to the north, the famous land to the north of the British Library, to reorient and take a building which is something of a fortress and make it a genuinely open campus at the heart of the knowledge quarter. Finally, our international purpose brings all of this together and there it really is the business of entering the digital age by sharing our patrimony and that means digitization partnerships around our Middle Eastern collections with the Qatar Foundation uh, we have projects underway bit by bit to unlock the treasures of our, these are our Malay collections, Hebrew manuscripts, uh, uh, with the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, working our way through our Greek collections, Persian collections with the Iranian Heritage Fund, uh, digitizing as much as we can of our great Indian and South Asian collections. We're proprietors of the India office archives and records. Uh, and we have just launched possibly our most ambitious possibly insane project so far, uh, called Two Centuries of Indian Print, where we have realized that we are holders of the greatest collection of Indian printed books outside South Asia, uh, and that we want to share those with the world. Uh, that is really testing our international purpose to its limit, uh, but we're framing it within um, one of, uh, if you want to distill this all, five big programs of change that bring all of this together. Uh, and they're simply expressed, but they will together, I hope, deliver what we think will be the British Library of the future. So heritage made digital, making sure that those most at-risk collections or most important collections, whether it is Indian printed books or audio collections, are made available and interoperable with the other great collections of the world uh, and the work that Mike has been doing on IIIF and so on creates a massive global community here if we get this right. Everything available. Uh, we want to ensure that this is not just digitized but dynamic, accessible, used. Everyone engaged. Uh, you can sense this but wanting to test that word everyone in our mission statement uh, to ensure that we're truly a national library, not just a Yorkshire and London library by the end of this process. 
and yes, two important programs of work on our physical estates around St Pancras and Boston Spa. So I think I will leave it there uh, to, uh, to conclude because I'm determined that we do leave a little bit of time uh, for Q&A. But just to say as a final reflection, I come into this world from uh, the allegedly future-facing world of broadcasting and digital and television. And I can only say uh, with absolute honesty that the library community is the most future-facing profession I have ever encountered, precisely because the greatest collections are the inheritors of material that dates back centuries or tens of centuries in some cases, and that delivers a time frame uh, for responsibility in future thinking that is always thinking 50, 100, 200 years ahead. Uh, you see that happening all over this co great community of national and international and academic libraries, nowhere more than here, and that's why it's such a pleasure to be here today. And thank you for the invitation.